Hi, this is the Change and Grow Wellness Show, the show for you, the busy professional who wants to live a healthier, happier life with increased energy and productivity. And I'm your host, Jackie Grant, and I'm here with Melissa Gall, who is a fitness and soft tissue professional. And Melissa is also a mother, as well as being a holistic core restore coach. Welcome, Melissa. Hello, Jackie. Thanks for having me on the show. That's brilliant. So today, what we're going to be talking about is pelvic health. So the core, what we all need to know about the core and pelvic floor dysfunction. So Melissa, just start off by telling us how you got to be doing what you're doing. Um, Originally, I started off as a normal fitness instructor. But then when I had my first son um, at about, it was 10 years ago, well, 11 years ago now. Um, Mm -hmm. I decided to retrain in pre-postnatal. I started to teach buggy classes then. Um, The reason I veered off into more um, diastasis health and pelvic floor and core um, dysfunction is because I suffered diastasis recti after I had my second child. So that's Mm -hmm. why I started to sort of naturally come into that sort of field. Brilliant. Great. And so... What would you say, why is it important for people to know about their pelvic health? Because it's not just when you're pregnant. I mean, overall, at any age, we should be making sure that we have good pelvic health. So why would you say it's important? Well, because um, a lot of people have urinary incontinence and they think that that's it. It's just a natural phase of life. But Mm. actually, there's a lot that people can do about it. Mm. Um, and also, if you have things like prolapse, there is ways that you can manage the symptoms by breathing properly, by working your pelvic floor. I mean, if we've got grade one, grade two, you can actually improve a prolapse. If we're looking at grade three, grade four, we have other things that can be applied. Mm. And then with things like diastasis recti, it, you don't have to live with it. There are things you can do to improve it. It doesn't have to be exercise. It could be massage. It could be eating better. It could be um, making sure you're hydrated and getting mm. enough protein. So it's mm. not really just about exercise. And there's so much that people can learn just by talking. Mm. And why would you say, because, you know, the core and pelvis are like, they, they both kind of work uh, together since, you know, in order to, in order for us to function that area. So why do you think that like people should be doing pelvic floor exercises? Um, well, with pelvic floor exercises, it's not just about squeezing. The whole, um, the whole breath is involved. So when you exhale and the lungs deflate, you create a vacuum in the tummy and your pelvic floor lifts as well. So it's not mm. really just about doing a squeeze. It's also mm. about incorporating the breath and then not just sticking to the Kegels. It's also moving on from the Kegels into movement because when people have an accident, it's not when they're stood still or sitting down, they have an accident. Mm. It's usually when you go and run for a bus or if you're going to quickly pick something up which fell, is falling on the floor. So it's training your body to actually function in those situations. Mm. And that's why it's important to move on from the key Mm. And because, I mean, I'm I'm sure there's signs, signs that people, common signs that people will know that they have a pelvic floor uh, dysfunction. So what what would those be? So um, with urinary incontinence or even faecal incontinence, it's obvious what the um, problems are. You might not get it when you're walking normally, but if you're running or jumping, then that's obviously that symptom. Mm. With um, pelvic organ prolapse, you've got either a feeling of heaviness or dragging in the pelvis or possibly lower back pain. Um, you, you have difficulty with sexual penetration, an inability mm. to wear tampons, mm. or even an, in, an inability to empty the bowels completely. Mm. And in worst case scenario, it's also tissues physically protruding out of the orifices. So that's for your pelvic organ prolapse. With diastasis recti, um, it's if you're moving or doing some kind of exercise and you notice a strange doming shape coming down the center. So 
the six pack line, the fascia in the center, you get a sort mm -hmm. of conical shape when you're doing something which the fascia can't hold in place. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a diastasis recti and that's happening when you do an exercise, you really shouldn't be doing that exercise. You need mm -hmm. to regret the exercise so that you can control and load that um, fascia. Um, mm. The other symptoms with diastasis recti sometimes is maybe lower back pain as well. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. And then there is also when you have overactive um, pelvic floor. So you could have a weak pelvic floor and you can also have an overactive pelvic floor. And the symptoms of that is urinary frequency, urgency, hesitancy. Yeah. Um, so, for example, if you want to go for a wee or even a poo and you can't relax the pelvic floor muscles to actually go mm. um, if you have constipation it the pelvic floor muscles may not be relaxing enough so that you can have a bowel movement mm. if you're straining and now if you are straining and you have constipation it's actually going to make your diastasis or your prolapse symptoms possibly worse because you're pushing on the weakest parts of the <laughs> core of the pelvic floor mm. um, if you have pain in the pelvic area anywhere mm. unexplained pain uh, sorry in the pelvic region hips um and even during after or um, bef um during intercourse as well mm. and sometimes there is also spasming of of the pelvic floor as well brilliant um also there's the hysterectomy people as well they may suffer some of these issues because obviously they've had a structure removed from inside the abdominal cavity. Mm. Brilliant, great. So, how? So, what are the main things that people could do in in order to, um, you know, strengthen the pelvic floor and and core? Okay, so you start off with your Kegel. People may have heard um, their healthcare professionals or maybe from somewhere else on how to do uh, a Kegel, so pelvic floor exercises. So we are trying to not to just work the front part of the pelvic floor, but also the back passage as well, because the um, pelvic floor is like a sling. So it's underneath the whole of your um, pelvis in the whole um, bowl. And it goes from the front and the pubis right to the back where the sacrum is. So when you lift and exhale, when you squeeze your pelvic floor, you need to try and draw in both sides. So it's like you're trying to stop a wee mid-flow, but you're also trying to stop um, passing gas. So imagine you're in a lift with George Clooney. And <laughs> you do not want to pass wind. So initially, you want to take a nice breath in and relax the pelvic floor. As you exhale, you squeeze in and then up as well. Now, if we add the breath to that, we actually use our natural movement of the whole area. So as you exhale, the lungs deflate and lift and the pelvic floor comes up. So then we're using the breath to help lift that pelvic floor as well. So you exhale mm. and lift that pelvic floor. Now, to, take, to actually transfer it to movement... You can actually do it in a daily basis whenever mm. you stand up out of a chair. So I'm just going to turn my screen quickly just mm -hmm. so that you can see what I'm talking about. Yeah. So if I'm sitting down in my chair, how many times do we stand up out of a chair? So I want to try, I want to try <laughs> something for me. Stand up out of your chair. Do you inhale, exhale, or do you hold your breath? So if you want to try this with me, and maybe, okay. people who are, maybe people who watch, they can try it as well. So stand yeah. and just notice what you're doing with your breath. Do you inhale, exhale, or do you hold your breath? I inhale. You inhale. Okay. Yeah. So this is where you can transfer um, your Kegel into your coming out of a chair. Mm. So we always exhale on exertion when we're training. Mm. So what I want to do is transfer... Um, your training stuff. So, so, for example, when we do a bench press, we exhale on the push. When we do a squat, yeah. we exhale as we stand. Standing yeah. out of the chair is no different to a squat. Yeah. So, if we inhale and we have a weakness on either because we have a diastasis recti or in the pelvic floor, 
we're creating an intra-abdominal pressure which is going to push on your weakest part. So ideally what we want to do is exhale to deflate the lungs mm -hmm. and then lift your pelvic floor as you stand. So try it with me then. So take a breath okay. and start. And then you're going to exhale, lift your pelvic floor and stand up. And that just takes the pressure off your pelvic floor because each time you either hold your breath or inhale, we're yeah. bearing down on that pelvic floor. Say mm -hmm. you're a new mom and you're holding a baby back in your arms, you've got the extra weight there as well. So yeah. imagine all that extra load that's going on those weak parts. We're just taking yeah. care of them. You exhale, you lift that pelvic floor. Oh. And even when you, for example, pick something heavy off the floor, either maybe you're shopping or if, again, you have a baby and you're picking baby out of the cot. Mm -hmm. So you lean forwards, mm -hmm. and you exhale, you hold your pelvic floor and tummy in and keep exhaling as you stand. That way mm -hmm. you engage your tummy, tummy muscles, you've engaged your pelvic floor, so we're protecting them and you're mm -hmm. exhaling to reduce the intra-abdominal pressure. So you're less likely to pull something in your back. Mm. So there's just two ways that you can transfer your Kegels into just daily life. Everyday stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So it's funny how I got up and I actually inhaled. Yes. Do you know what I mean? So I, I, I don't really know it. I didn't really, I wouldn't have noticed that until you just yes. said that. Do you know what I mean? Say if you're a nurse and maybe you work with... Um, people moving people from one bed to another, male or female, it doesn't matter. Mm. Every time you pick something weighty, if you hold your breath or inhale to move mm. that person, if you already have a small prolapse, you could very well just push that prolapse further. Mm. So it's so important. You, you start to get ready to move that person on the bed. You exhale, hold your tummy, and then keep exhaling and move the person onto the other bed. Brilliant. So especially people who are taking care of maybe elderly people as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, that, and that's the thing, because people just think that there's certain times you need to, well, normally pregnancy, that you need to focus on your pelvic health, but you have to focus on it all throughout your life. So. All throughout. Mm. And also, um, when we hit menopause as well, our yeah. um, estrogen reduces and our, yeah. our collagen tissue becomes poorer. Mm. So we want to make sure that we're avoiding creating a prolapse mm. by protecting them, not necessarily just training them. Mm. And this mm. breath management actually really, really helps to protect the tissues. Great. So... Um... Do you want to tell us about if someone came to you, what kind of screening in terms of, um, you know, pelvic floor health would you be giving them? So I would normally ask the questions that I would, if there is a symptom, I would ask that question if, you, if they have that symptom. So mm. the symptoms I mentioned earlier, I very well could be asking about them as well. So I would ask, have you got a heaviness in your pelvis area? Are you suffering from back pain? Have you mm. got glute pain? Or, you know, mm. just all of these sorts of things. Mm. Have you got a diastasis rectus? Have you been toned? Do you, um, have you got any difficulty inserting a tampon, for example? Mm. Mm. So all these questions can and should be asked. They mm. may seem irrelevant to somebody who hasn't got the symptoms. Mm. But mm. if we're not screening, yeah. then who else is? I mean, when I exactly. went for my six-week check after I had my babies, I didn't get asked any of these questions. Yeah. So all the people get missed. They go to high-intensity classes. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you've had a baby. People who haven't had a baby can get diastasis yeah. sometimes. Yeah. And people who haven't had a baby do get prolapses. Yeah. So it's not really about having a baby or not. Yeah. It's just yeah. learning how to take care of our bodies properly. Exactly. Brilliant. Great. So do you want to um, take us through a case study of a client that you may have, you know, come come across that has had a, you know, pelvic um, floor dysfunction and, you know, what kind of outcomes that that person's had with you? So in the last 
okay, I've been with this one lady. I've had five sessions with her. The first session was a massage. She mm-hmm. had a diastasis recti of three fingers. She wasn't mm-hmm. suffering any urinary incontinence at this point, mm-hmm. but she was suffering quite a lot of back pain. Mm-hmm. Um, now, a lot of people think to fix a diastasis, you need to exercise. Mm-hmm. Okay. Maybe there might be a little bit of exercise, but mm-hmm. I find that massage is normally one of the best ways of um, reducing tension. So mm. with this lady, she had a lot of tension in her lower back, for example, mm. and she had very, very tight oblique muscles, which are these mm. muscles here, mm. for people who might not know. So we released the back and these, and within the first massage appointment, it had already started to narrow. Brilliant. So we would look also at ribs and how she breathes. Um, and within... I think it was three weeks. So we had two exercise sessions. The first session where we did movement, it was Mm. mainly release work, opening up the chest. Mm. She was very, very tight through the chest because she was breastfeeding Mm. Um, and opening up through the quads. She was very tight on her quads. So that's the front of the thighs um, and hip flexors. So Mm. the reason why I was doing these is because, so let me just demonstrate. Mm. So there is me standing with a, a bad posture, right? Yeah. Chest sort of hung low. So my mm. ribs are pushing down into my tummy. My, my tummy starts to push outwards. Mm. So that is creating intra-abdominal pressure, which I can instantly fix by opening my chest. Yeah. So where she had all this pressure coming through the front, we just opened this up for her. Mm. Um, made sure that she was holding her head in the right place, also brought her pelvis in a better place. And then by the second session, we then started to load the muscles a little bit more. But after the massage, after the release work, by the third session, we'd got her, her, her width down to one finger from three fingers. Brilliant. And that wasn't including any exercise. Mm. Then we also included... We checked how much water she was drinking, how much protein she was consuming, mm. making sure that she's eating the right things, um, making sure she, her body isn't inflamed, so we're not putting too much sugar in her, because it's an inflammation straight, yeah. it inflames the body. She's yeah. not getting a lot of sleep, so we mm. added a little bit of breathing techniques to help down train the mm. sympathetic nervous system as well. Yeah. So mm. all of that... Before we even did exercise, we already decreased the um, diastasis. So Brilliant. she's a very happy lady at the moment. And actually making her feel so much better by the incre- increased hydration, better yeah. sleep, better nutrition, making sure she's getting enough protein. Exactly. And because the tissues we're trying to repair are collagen, it's protein and water. If we're deficient yeah. from either of those two, we're not giving mm. the, body the building blocks it needs to help repair itself Mm. so how much protein would you say that someone actually needs yeah i wouldn't go by i wouldn't go by weighing but i would give the body a little bit of protein at each meal that they have yeah so a little bit at breakfast even to stabilize their blood sugar levels throughout Mm. the morning and Mm. then you might not have the um sugary snacks Mm mid-morning when you sort of hit the floor (laughs) <laughs> mm. uh, a little bit for lunch because sometimes people save their protein for their evening meal whereas yeah. we can be giving the body what it needs throughout the course of the day exactly exactly that and healthy fats and exactly. and making sure they're getting enough omega threes, omega threes for the brain yeah exactly so anti-inflammatory again exactly brilliant that's great so do you want to give um listeners um uh, final tips around you know um core and pelvic dysfunction you know what they should be doing any final tips Melissa okay so as I mentioned earlier we want to always exhale on the exertion so if you are doing something which is taxing and you're holding your breath it's a sure sign that you should be exhaling so that's literally the top tip that you can take away from this Make sure that you're not, if you are, um, um, if you've got urinary incontinence, 
and you are stopping or limiting your water or your hydration, you're actually making your incontinence worse. Because mm-hmm. there's less liquid in the bladder, it's more concentrated, it irritates the bladder more, which means you have to go even more frequently. So mm-hmm. you think that because you reduce your hydration, your intake of water, you're going to reduce the amount of needing to wee, you actually mm-hmm. increase it because the bladder can't hold on to that. So tip number two, make sure you're not dehydrated. Very, mm-hmm. very important. And if you're not sure and you have any of those symptoms I mentioned before, just go and see a women's health physio. Even if you have no symptoms, maybe you should just go every six months. It's like, like you go to a dentist. Yeah. But if, you, if you've got something just a little bit happening, you might just be able to catch it before it becomes worse. Mm. And then if anyone's told you you need surgery, make sure you go through all the options before because surgery really has to be the last option. Yeah. Um, because it can open another can of worms. Yeah. So exactly. Hopefully with those. And if they need to contact me to give them details of women's health physio, there is at least three in our vicinity here. There's one I know by Whips Cross, there's another one in Loughton and there's another one in the East Village. So not immediately next to us, but um there's there's options as well. Okay. And Melissa, where can people find you? So you can either email me, um, melissagall.walker at gmail.com. And I, I check my emails incessantly, so yeah. <laughs> I will definitely see them. Or they can go to my website where there's all my contact details in there. My website is Melissa Movement and Massage. Okay. Brilliant. Great. So guys, so we've gone through why it's important for pelvic health with the common signs and symptoms of, you know, pelvic health and why you should really, really make sure that you're using your breath, um, making sure you've got the right nutrition and hydration. So thank you very much, Melissa, for coming on today and telling our listeners all about this so guys if you need any support around um you know your core pelvic health you know even massage because um melissa also does soft tissue massage then she's there to help you and she's told you where you can find her so take mm-hmm. care and we will be on the show next week with another fun packed um interesting giving you more information about health nutrition wellness and how you can grow better in your life okay so take care guys thank you very much Jackie for having me that's all right (laughs) bye-bye bye